people of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. On this very tragic night, as we commemorate the legacy of Qamar Bani Hashim, the moon of Bani Hashim, I extend to you my sincerest condolences on the martyrdom of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salawatullahi alayhi. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was the commander of the Imam's army. He was the refuge for the women and the children in Karbala. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam has many qualities, but amongst his most important qualities, highlighted by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt is the following quality. Al-Imam Sadiq alayhi salam in describing his great uncle, he says, Kana ammun al-Abbas alayhi salam nafidh al-basira sulb al-Iman. Our uncle Abbas was sharp in his vision, very firm and fixed in his Iman. These are two amazing qualities for Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. He's very firm, he's a pillar when it comes to his resolve, when it comes to his faith. It's unwavering, unshakable, deep rooted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, he had sharp vision. Some people, they have no vision in this world. They don't know where they're heading. Where is their final destination? But Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas had very sharp vision. He was able to see the reality of this life. He was able to foresee the Akhirah and he was able to prepare himself for the Akhirah. Nafidh al-Basira. Now our most important destination is the destination on the Day of Judgment. That is the Akhirah, it's our final destination. Many people spend so much time in this world for a small vacation. Have you seen some people when they want to go on a vacation? They plan so much. I know some people they'll sit for a couple of months finding flights, hotels, activities, reading reviews, hundreds of reviews they read them before they decide on their hotel, on their vacation package. And you just want to go for a week and have fun. Your final destination is the Akhirah. How much research did we do to better know the Akhirah and to better be prepared for the Akhirah? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas always had the Akhirah on his mind. That's why historians tell us when, we, when he managed on the day of Ashura to get to the river of Furat, he managed to get some water in the bucket as he was leaving, trying to go back to the tents shortly before his martyrdom, he said these words, لا أرهب الموت إذ الموت رقى. I have no fear if death meets me, if death comes to me. حتى أواري في المصاليت لقى. I will fight my enemies with my swords. I have nothing to fear. I give my life for the very self of the Prophet, meaning my brother Hussein. He's like the self of the Prophet. Here I am, Abbas. I am taking the water for the woman and the children. I have no fear at all for that day, the day of the grand meeting, the day of judgment. Can you say that, my dear brothers and sisters? Can you say, I have no fear for the day of judgment? That's Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. That's how confident he was. That's how firm he was. He says, I have no fear at all for that day because I am prepared. I know exactly what I am doing and where I am going. As a believer, can I say this about my life? Am I positive with everything about my activities? Do I know exactly what I'm doing, where I'm going?
Do I have a plan? Do I have a roadmap or I'm lost? This brings us to the discussion on the Day of Judgment. And in our brief discussion tonight, we'll try to get some glimpses of the Day of Judgment so we can better prepare for this day. Because my dear brothers and sisters, the reality is it's a difficult day. People be mindful of Allah, have piety for that tremor, that quake, the earthquake of the hour is very severe. يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَتْ وَتَضَعُ كُلُّ ذَاتِ حَمْلٍ حَمْلَهَا وَتَرَى النَّاسَ سُكَارًا وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارًا وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٌ On that day you'll see, it's as if you can see, a woman who's pregnant will miscarry, will deliver. A breastfeeding woman who's nursing her child, because of the severity of that day, she'll even forget that she's holding a child in her hands. And we know how close a mother is to her child when she's nursing him. You look at people, you think they were drunk. But the Quran says, no, 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 they're not drunk. But the punishment is severe for the evildoers. Now, this does not mean that we should be scared of the day of judgment unconditionally. The day of judgment is like your graduation day. If you've not been prepared, you failed all your exams, you will partying all semester. Yes, obviously the graduation date is a miserable date for you because you're not going to graduate and everyone will find out. But if you've prepared well, the day of graduation is a day you look forward to. So yes, the day of judgment is severe. But for those who are prepared, they look forward to it because it's their graduation. Honestly, it's in my hands. I can choose to make the Day of Judgment a pleasant day for me or a miserable day. It's in your hands here in this dunya. The belief in the Day of Judgment is extremely important. In fact, if you want to summarize religion in two words, it's Mabda and Ma'at, origin, who created you, Allah, and where you're going. Everything else falls in between, the beginning and the end. That's why the Abrahamic faiths are all based on the belief in the Day of Judgment. The Holy Quran tells us about previous prophets. Every single prophet talked about the Day of Judgment. Yawm al-Qiyamah, heaven, hell, what would happen there? All Abrahamic faiths, all faiths that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some researchers have examined the Quran and they have come to discover that we have about 1,400 verses in the Holy Quran about the Day of Judgment. 1,400 verses. That's about a fifth of the Quran. Can you imagine how important this subject is? This is a very important subject. And intellectually we know there must be a Day of Judgment because I know God is wise. He created me for a purpose. That purpose is not fulfilled in this world. Allah's plan is much bigger than this world. The reward that God give, gives to the believers, it's not found in this world. The justice that Allah will serve, the criminals who get away with their crime. I know there must be a day of judgment where the good doer is fully rewarded and the evil doer is going to be punished. This world is too small for us to truly see that grand justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the grand mercy of God and the punishment of God. Intellectually, we know there must be a day. Allah would not create this universe in vain. In fact, when you look at Surah Al-Dukhan verses 38 to 40, what does Allah state? وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ we did not create this universe in vain, as if we're playing. We created them only in truth. But many people, the pagans and the disbelievers, they don't know. After Allah mentions that this universe serves a purpose, Allah says, The day of judgment, يوم الفصل, the day of deciphering, the day of distinction is the appointment for everyone. Intellectually, there is a day of judgment. And the Holy Quran is filled with verses about the day of judgment. 
And because this day is so critical, the Holy Quran gives us so many names for this day. You know, the day of judgment has many names. Yawm al Qiyamah, the day of Qiyamah. Qiyamah comes from Qiyam standing. Everyone will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on their feet. Yawm al Fas, the day of distinction. Allah will decipher the good ones from the bad ones. Yawm al Haq, the day of the truth. Yawm al Hasra, the day of extreme regret. Everyone will have regrets. The evil ones, obviously, we know why. But even the good ones, why did I not do more? Why did I not prepare better for this day? Yawm at talaq not talaq. There's two words here. Talaq means divorce. Yawm at talaq it comes from the word liqa, talaqi, the day of meeting. We'll meet everyone on the day of judgment. You'll meet previous civilizations. The good people will meet the bad people. The bad people meet the good people. We meet the angels, they meet us. It's a grand day of meaning. The biggest meaning in history, in existence. Yawm at tanad from Nida. On that day, you'll see groups of people calling on one another. The people of hell calling on the people of heaven. Help us, send us from some of your sustenance. It's a very important day. It's a very critical day. Yawm al khulud the day of eternity. It will not end. The day of judgment will continue. Heaven and hell will continue into eternity. So we find that the day of judgment has many names. Now, when does the day of judgment officially start? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Zumar verse 68, about two blows into the trumpet. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ And it will be blown into the trumpet, into the horn. You find everyone in the heavens and on earth is going to lose their state of awareness. Come to a standstill. Become unconscious. That marks the beginning of the Day of Judgment. Now when you look at the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, how they vividly describe this horn, it's truly beyond our comprehension. In Arabic, the word sur basically means a horn taken from an ox. It's hollow inside. People back then would use it to announce, let's say, um, a caravan's moving or stopping or a battle is starting. So we know it's something that generates a voice. The Holy Quran says, there is a horn that will be blown into and one of God's greatest angels, Israfil, he will blow into it. And Imam Zain al-Abidin describes what this horn is. Don't think of a horn like literally a horn like you see here in this world. This horn is beyond our imagination. The Imam salam says this horn has one head and two sides. The distance between these two sides is as big as the universe. Can you imagine? Something that fills the entire universe. And then the Imam Ali Salam says there are holes in this trumpet as many as there are souls that Allah has created. How many souls are there? How many billions and trillions? Angels, humans, jinns. This is such a massive horn. There are holes in it, as many as there are souls in existence. He blows into the trumpet, everything freezes and loses consciousness. Another word for this is a sayha. Allah talks about this in Surah Yasin. That the sayha, this loud voice will come, this noise will come, and it will change everything. Have you heard of a sonic boom? Sometimes how sound can cause destruction. Now imagine something as massive as the universe generating some sort of waves. What would happen? When Israfil blows into the trumpet, everything changes. It causes a ripple effect around the universe. The earth here, the mountains will shatter and come into small pieces. The planets will collide into one another. The stars will collide into one another. It's a massive event, event beyond our comprehension. That's the first time. Allah tells Israfil, blow into the trumpet, everything, everything dies. Then Allah tells Israfil, you die. 
And then Allah speaks, لِمَنُ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Who's the king today? All those who challenged me, who were so arrogant, where are you now? لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَرِ Allah will answer himself, no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ruling today. He's the king today. Then in, in this verse, verse 68 of Surah Al-Zumar, it indicates there is an, a second blow into the trump. ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهَا أُخْرَى Then a second time it will be blown into it. فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامٌ يَنْظُرُونَ You see people standing. One hadith states the duration between the first blow and the second one is 40 years. Now remember when we talk about years, it doesn't have to be years as we know today because time is relative and it depends on the movement and the orbits. So there some time will pass, everyone is dead, no consciousness. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares the earth for resurrection. One hadith states Allah causes the rain, a special type of rain to come down on the earth for 40 days. Now the clay, the upper crust of the earth is ready for resurrection, for revival. Allah now is going to revive everyone who passed away and became dust. So Allah resurrects Israfil, He tells him, blow a second time. When He blows a second time, everything comes to life. Now the day of judgment has begun for everyone. This will be one of the most difficult moments in our existence. One hadith states the human being goes through difficult moments. One of them is death when we die. One of them is the day of judgment when you're resurrected. You see everything changes. That world that I knew, that world that I loved, my house, my car, the buildings, the skyscrapers, the beautiful sceneries, it's all destruction. We stand on the day of judgment here on this earth, but it's going to be a different earth. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضِ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ on that day, this earth is going to be a different earth. Everything will be different. This will be a moment of shock for everyone. So we rise out of our graves. Now my dear brothers and sisters, if you read Nahj al-Balagha and the words of Imam Ali salam, the Imam tells us that it will be so packed on Sahat al-Mahshar where people will stand, that if you can find a place to stand on your feet, you're lucky. People will be like arrows stacked in a case. There's no room to add no, another arrow. That's how crowded it is. Remember, throughout history, how many billions and trillions of creations that Allah create? All of them will be standing in one area. That in itself is a moment of difficulty. Imagine, you rise out of your graves and billions of people are around you. But of course for the believers it will be a different experience, but we have to be ready my dear brothers and sisters. In one hadith from Ibn Mas'ud, he says, I heard Ali ibn Abi Talib salam state that when we emerge from our graves, that is the first station of the Day of Judgment. And this station will last 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Then the Imam says there are 50 stations on the Day of Judgment. Doesn't the Quran say on the, the Day of Judgment lasts 50,000 years? Imam Ali السلام, breaks it down for us. He says there are 50 stations, each one is a thousand years. Allahu Akbar. Are we ready for this my dear brothers and sisters? It's only my deeds that will help me there. You want this to be a breeze? You want this to be a pleasant experience? Or you want to stand there 50,000 years? It's in your hands here in this dunya. Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam in dua Abu Hamza al Thamali, and you're all familiar with it. He cries for this moment. Abki l'khuruji min qabri. I cry for the moment I emerge from my grave. Oriyanan dhalilan, unclothed, humiliated. I'm carrying my sins on my back. Of course, the Imam is describing people, not himself. Otherwise, the true believers, they will be honored and clothed on the Day of Judgment. But it's a difficult moment. It's your deeds that will decide how you leave from your grave. One hadith states there is a group of people 
they will emerge from their graves. Their hands are tied around their necks. They cannot eat, they cannot help themselves. And the angels rebu rebuke them and they tell them, shame on you, Allah gave you money in dunya, you did not spend it the halal way and you did not spend it for charity. You withheld the rights of the poor. The one who does not give his religious dues, there's a consequence, my dear brothers and sisters. That's one. Another one is an namam the tattletale. The one who causes fitna between people. You go to your friend and you tell him what someone else said about him or her. And you cause disunity in the community. This has consequences. The hadith states these people will come out of their graves and there is a black python snake that will keep biting them on the day of judgment. And remember, this is a 50,000 year day, long day. It's not a, a very quick day. And then the one who gets drunk, the drunkard, people who allowed themselves to take intoxicants, to fall to haram drugs because of their association with bad friends. The hadith states they will emerge from their graves and the stench coming from them will bother everyone around them such that wherever they go, people will curse them. May God curse you because of the stench that's emanating from you. What is it that you did? Of course, my dear brothers and sisters, remember one thing. As we talk about these glimpses of the Day of Judgment, this is if someone doesn't repent. Inshallah, tomorrow night we'll talk about repentance. If you repent, Allah will save you from all of this. That's if I die negligent, careless. But if I die, I know we all have mistakes, Allah forgives. But these are realistic scenes from the Day of Judgment. I know some people don't like to talk about the Day of Judgment, but that's your final destination. Why don't you want to talk about it? Everyone's heading there, everyone. Now one of the deeds that will give you peace and security while you're emerging from your grave is what? is bringing peace and happiness to the heart of a fellow believer. Someone needs your help, your psychological help, your financial help. Someone's going through a crisis, you stand with them, you help them, you make them happy. The hadith says, promise from Allah, this person will emerge in a state of security and peace and will not suffer as they emerge from their graves. It's in your hands. You can decide what kind of experience you'll have after we emerge from our graves. Once we emerge from our graves, the hadith states you can actually see hell. People can see hell from far away, from a distance. The Imam says you can even hear the sound of hell, the voice of hell. You can hear it, everyone can hear it. As we're marching there, there will be complete darkness such that people will say to Allah on the Day of Judgment, Oh God, have mercy on us, it's too dark. We're tired of this darkness, show us light. The hadith says then the people will see shining faces bringing light to everyone on the Day of Judgment. They will say, Oh Allah, who are these? Are these angels? It will be said to them, No, they're not angels. Who are they? Are they prophets? No. Who are they? Allah tells them, ask them. People will ask these shining faces, who are you? They will say, we are the Alawiyun, the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt from the progeny of Ali and Fatima. My dear brothers and sisters, our Imams are the source of our guidance. They show us the way, hold on to them on the day of judgment. Yes, it's your deeds, but your deeds are tied to your Imams. Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, on that day, we'll resurrect you with your Imam. How close were you to the Imam of your time? You know why people failed the test during the time of Imam Hussein They knew God existed, many of them considered themselves Muslims, they read Quran, they prayed. Yes, some of the killers of Imam Hussein, they prayed. Some of them had memorized the Quran, but they did not stand with the Imam of their time. 
That's a lesson for me. How close am I to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt who show me right from wrong, who bring me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you live with the love of Ahlul Bayt and the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and following them, the more you'll have light on the Day of Judgment. This hadith states the Imams of Ahlul Bayt will shine to everyone on the Day of Judgment. So now we go to the next stage. The next very important station on that day is Al-Mizan. In Surah Al-Qara'a, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to the Mizan. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ The one whose Mizan, whose scales will be light. وَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ Some people know their Mawazin, their Mizan, their scale is going to be heavy. Which one are you? Which camp? Now scholars have given us two scenarios here, two understandings of how the Mizan works. Some believe it's a scale with two sides. One side for your good deeds, one side for your bad deeds. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you win. You pass the trial. Some have envisioned it differently. They say, no, it's one scale. If it's heavy, that means Allah has accepted your deeds. They have value, they have weight, you're saved. But if it's light, then you have not passed the trial. So there are different understandings of exactly how this Mizan is. And some scholars believe it's symbolic. It's just another way for saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reckon you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge you. What are some of the best deeds to be placed in our Mizan? One hadith from the Prophet ﷺ states, the salat on me and my family, when you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad, that will be the heaviest deed to be placed in your Mizan. My dear brothers and sisters, you know why? The salawat summarizes Islam for you. If you truly mean it, not just utter it, we're talking about the reality of salawat, not just someone who utters it and sins left and right. Examine and dissect the salawat. It starts with Allahumma, my dear God, that's Tawheed. You remind yourself of Tawheed when you say the salawat. Salli ala Muhammad, that's my Prophet. Wa Ali Muhammad. The Imams of Ahl al Bayt, you have Usul al Deen, the pillars of faith embedded in the salawat. Oh Allah, you're wise, you're just. You have chosen them for me and you have a purpose. If you've chosen them and you will send your prayers on them, where is Allah going to give Muhammad and Al Muhammad their full reward? Of course not in this dunya, in the akhirah. You see even the day of judgment is embedded in the salawat because that's what the salawat means. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salawat on the Prophet and the Imams, he elevates their status, he gives them his full reward and that can only take place on the Day of Judgment. That will be the heaviest deed to be put in your scale. What else do we have? We have your akhlaq, your attitude, humbleness, arrogance, anger. Your akhlaq, how you deal with other people is amongst the heaviest deeds placed in that mizan, my dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that you learn from the akhlaq of Imam al Hussein. In these nights, we're going through a transformation. Be kind even when those who wrong you. Be kind to them. Show them that compassionate heart. Be humble. Don't allow for any arrogance in your heart. Because on that day, in the Mizan, the best deed for you is your akhlaq. If you had some shortcomings here and there, that's okay. Your akhlaq will compensate. Allah will ask you about everything in that moment. The Prophet says, every person in the Mizan during the station of the scale is going to be asked about these four. How did you spend your life and your youthful days? How did you spend your money? How did you spend your money? You will be asked about that. How did you earn your money? And our wilaya, the Ahl al Bayt. Did this person honor the wilaya of Ahl al Bayt or no? That's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us by the Mizan. One hadith goes into further detail. One hadith states as you're standing for the Hisab and the Mizan for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reckon you and judge you, 
For every single day of your life, you'll see f 24 boxes. 24 boxes. For each hour, there's a box that passes before you. If you obeyed Allah in that hour, you did a good deed, whether it's prayer, Quran, helping someone, working halal, whatever it is, going to a majlis, you will find that the box will open with a beautiful scent and a beautiful light that will save you. And then some boxes will be opened, no. There will be flames coming out of them, a stench coming out of them. You will be told these are the hours that you spent in God's disobedience. All of that will be presented before us, my dear brothers and sisters. And for a lot of people, this will take a long time. Imagine if everything that we did in life, Allah will question us about, how long will that take? It's already a difficult day. One hadith states, everything in dunya that was not dedicated for Allah, you'll be asked about. You'll be asked about. Even if it was halal, Allah will still ask you. I gave you resources, how did you use them? One hadith states, there are two people on the Day of Judgment, they're both believers, both of them. One of them was poor, one of them is rich. The poor person is now about to be judged by Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, what did you do in life? Tell me. The poor person will say, Allah, I have nothing for you to ask me about. I didn't have a position to abuse it. I didn't have any money. I didn't have anything. Allah tells him, okay, go to paradise. Then the rich guy comes. Allah will question him. He'll be delayed. When they meet in heaven, the poor guy asks the rich guy, what is it that delayed you? He says, Allah asked me about everything. Everything that I did in life, everything that I spent, Allah asked me about it. My dear brothers and sisters, the hadith states, do you want to make this fast? Dedicate everything for Allah, everything that you do. In the morning you wake up, say, oh Allah, today I'm going to school to learn, to educate myself for your cause. That's it. Allah is not going to ask you about that anymore. Oh Allah, I'm going to work today for your cause. And remember, when you make the intention for Allah, you're much less likely to sin that day because you started the day with a conversation with your Lord that I'm dedicating my day to you. It's very unlikely that you will sin that day and violate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's even a beautiful technique to keep us in check. So this is the hisab, the station of the hisab. And my dear brothers and sisters, if we in the hisab deny anything, there's two major witnesses there. Of course, Allah, the angels, yes. But two witnesses. One, there's a book. The Quran says there is a book that will be hung around your neck. Everything is mentioned in it. And number two, your limbs, your body parts. Read Surah Fussalat, verses 20 to 21. شَهِدَ عَلَيْهِمْ سَمْعُهُمْ وَأَبْصَارُهُمْ وَجُلُودُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ On the day of judgment, your eyes, your ears, your limbs, everything is going to testify and speak on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, this person did this on so and so day. وَقَالُوا لِجُلُودِهِمْ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا You'll say to your skin, why did you expose me? Why? Why did you speak? This is Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. What will they say? Allah caused us to speak because Allah has inspired everything to speak on the day of judgment. If I don't repent, yes, my body parts can expose me on the day of judgment. Once we finish this station, my dear brothers and sisters, then the final station, remember there's 50, we just br briefly summarized it for you. There's many other stations. But the next major station is Sirat. You've heard of the Sirat. The Sirat is the way. Sirat is a bridge that takes you to paradise, but it passes over hellfire. وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا Allah says, everyone's going to pass through hell. Even the believers, how? on the Sirat. But you know how the Sirat is? Imagine, it's a valley underneath it, hellfire is underneath it. You know what this Sirat is? One hadith states it's sharper than a sword and finer than a strand of hair. Can you maintain your balance? My dear brothers and sisters, if you don't have deeds, 
good deeds on the day of judgment. You can't pass that salah. Allah is Rahim, yes. Allah is merciful, yes. Ask His mercy now. Repent now. Don't delay it. Don't let dunya distract you. Is it worth it? For 50, 60, 70 years, 80 years. And I put myself in eternal misery because of this dunya. I oppress others. I wrong them. I hurt them. Make a commitment tonight with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salam. I will live a life I won't hurt anyone. I'll be pleasant with everyone. I won't injure anyone's emotions and feelings. If you're like that, you'll have a very pleasant experience. There are some people, the Imam says, have you seen how fast lightning is? Lightning, right? The, the, that's the speed of light. That's how they'll, they'll pass Sirat, through their good deeds. It is possible. But let's believe in the Day of Judgment, my dear brothers and sisters. And then once we pass the bridge of Sirat, then there is the pool of Kawthar, where the Prophet is standing, where Ali ibn Abi Talib is standing. And all the believers go there. Imam Ali with his blessed hands, he feeds them from this pool of Al Kawthar. And then they enter paradise. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us there. We say, Oh Allah, we have many shortcomings. But there is one thing that we're honest with. We love your the Ahl al Bayt of your Prophet. We love Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And we are thankful to you, O oh Allah, for giving us such leaders. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in all of these moments. On the day of judgment, when people see the station and the status of Abu al Fadl al Abbas, everyone will be shocked. Al Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam states, May Allah bless Al Abbas ibn Ali alayhi salam. May Allah bless my dear uncle. For he truly passed his trial and he sacrificed his life for his brother Hussein until his hands were amputated and cut off. And on the day of judgment, Allah will compensate him by giving him exceptional wings by which he's going to fly. And on the day of judgment, here's the part. On the day of judgment, Al-Abbas will have such an amazing position that all the shuhada of history, they will envy him when they see what Allah gave to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. We ask Allah to grant us the shafa'a of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas on such a night. Now take your hearts to Karbala. It's on the 10th day of Muharram. The companions of Al-Imam al hussein alayhi salam have been slaughtered. The family members of Imam al Hussein have been slaughtered. Ali al Akbar, al Qasim, the only man who remains besides Aba Abdullah al Hussein is Abu al Fadl al Abbas. La ilaha illallah. Abu al Fadl al Abbas was the carrier of the Imam's banner, commander of the army. The Imam السلام, needed Abu al Fadl al Abbas to be there protecting the women and the children. But Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, he ran out of patience because he would hear the women and especially the children calling Al-Atayash, al -atash. Imagine you hear children almost dying from thirst. What, what can you do? Have you seen a child who suffers? What happens to your heart? It's very difficult on the heart. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he sees these children. They're crying, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. He comes to his master, Hussein. He tells him, my dear Imam, my dear master, please give me. Please give me the permission to fight these enemies. I can no longer stand like this. The Imam السلام, hugs him. He tells him, my dear brother, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. I have no one but you left. How can you leave us in these critical moments? He keeps, he keeps begging the Imam for permission until finally the Imam السلام, tells him, okay, if you must go, then at least go to the river and see if you can bring some water for these 
women and children. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam prepares himself, he farewell, fair farewells his brother. But yes, the women and the children, they had hope. Zainab had her eyes on Abbas. Sakina had her eyes. Ruqayya, the woman, the children, they all had their eyes on the hero of Karbala. He takes the bucket of water with him. He storms into the battlefield. He manages to arrive at the banks of the river of Furat. There were hundreds of men guarding the banks. But this is the ferocious lion. This is the grandson. This is the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He manages, O oh believers, to disperse them from around the river. He attacks them and he manages to get to the river. Now imagine the scene, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. After two, three days, he touches the water, he feels the water, he goes inside the water. He looks at the water, the horse is right next to him. He looks at the water, but then suddenly he remembers the Atash of Hussein, he had taken some water to drink and order to gain some strength to fight these enemies. But Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas loves Hussein more than anything. How can he taste the water? When Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam is thirsty, so he begins to speak. He begins. He begins to speak to himself. Shortly before trying to drink the water, he says, "Ya nafsu min ba'dil Hussein huni." O self, humble yourself before Hussein. Wa ba'dahu ma kunti anta kuni. You think you can live after Hussein? Your life is from Hussein. Hada Hussein warid al manuni. This is Hussein surrounded by death. And you have the audacity to drink the water. No, I swear by Allah, this is not what my religion teaches me. My religion teaches me to be loyal to my brother. If he's thirsty, I'll stay thirsty. O oh, believers, he fills the bucket. He rides his horse. But now Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salam, his only hope in life at this point is to get the water to Hussein, to the woman and the children. This is now his only objective. He rides on his horse. He marches back to the tents, trying to get there as soon as possible. They announce in the army, don't let him get to Hussein, for we know what will happen if Hussein Hussein drinks the water and he gains strength and Abbas drinks the water, they will eliminate us. Do whatever you can to stop them. As Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam was heading back to the tent, one of the enemies was hiding behind a tree. He makes a surprise attack. He takes out his sword. He strikes at Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, striking him on his right arm. He amputates the right arm of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he realizes he's lost his right arm. He begins to recite these lines, Wallahi in qata'tumu yameeni. I swear by Allah, if you cut my right hand, inni uhami abadan an deeni. I swear by Allah, I'll continue defending my religion, defending the Imam of my time. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, at this point, he still has hope because now he still has the bucket. You know what he does now that he lost his right arm? He holds his sword in the left arm and he puts the bucket in his teeth, carrying it with his mouth. He still has hope. I'm going to get the water to the women and the children. Sakina has her eyes on me. Imam Hussein is waiting for me. Zainab is waiting for me. He advances forward. Oh believers, when another of the enemies, he charges at Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He takes out the sword. This time he amputates his left hand. Hand. Now Abu al-Fatl al-Abbas is left without any hands, without any sword to protect himself. It's just him on the horse carrying with his mouth the bucket of water, the sack of water. But oh believers, at this point he still has hope. He's still trying his best to go to the tents, to give them the 
water for the women and the children who were eagerly waiting. At that point, they surround him from every direction. Then they take out the spears and the arrows. The arrows come running, raining on him. Oh, believers, one of those arrows comes on Abel Fadl al-Abbas in his eye. One of the arrows goes into the eyes of Abel Fadl al-Abbas but he still has hope. He's still trying to get the bucket of water. But the tragedy comes when an arrow is shot at the sack of water, at the bucket of water. It pierces it open and all the water spills. Historian state, at that point when the water spills, Abel Fadl Abbas salam stops. <laughs> Now his enemies are watching. Why is it that he stopped? He was going to the tents. He was so eager. But now Abbas stops. He doesn't know where to go. How does he go to the tents? <laughs> How does he see his brother Hussein and Zainab with no hands and with no bucket of water? He's standing over there losing all hope. <laughs> what a difficult moment. Oh believers, at that moment, one of those enemies, he takes out an iron rod, he attacks Abel Fadl al-Abbas salam on his head. He strikes him on his head. Rahim Allahu man nada wa Abbas. Oh believers, imagine if you're riding on the horse, and when you fall from the horse, normally when you fall from somewhere, you extend your hands to stop the impact of the fall. Abel Fadl al-Abbas, you know how he fell? You know how he fell from the horse? He doesn't have hands to protect himself and there's a spear in his eyes. He came crashing to the ground, collapsing on the ground. But at this point, he could not help himself but cry, Akhi Hussein alayka minni salam. My dear brother Hussein, I send my final salam to you. Imam al Hussein hears his voice. He comes rushing to the scene. But when he arrives close, what does he see? He sees the head of Abel Fadl crushed. He sees a spear, an arrow in his eyes. He sees him without two hands. Yes, the Imam alayhi salam comes to him, but his back was bent. He tells him, أخي الآن انكسر ظهري وقلت حيلتي My dear brother, now my back has been bent. وقلت حيلتي, now I've lost my foremost supporter. What do I do now at this point? Yes, the Imam alayhi salam, he sits next to him. The Imam alayhi salam is trying to wipe the dust from him. He carries his head in his lap. Yes, O oh believers, one hadith states, Abel Fadl al-Abbas, he would pull his head away from Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein would tell him, my dear brother, it's me Hussein, why do you do that? He tells him, my dear brother, in an hour or so, when they kill you, there will be no one to to carry your head in their lap. I want to die like you, Abba Abdullah. And then one narration states, he tells him, give my salam <laughs> to the children. Give my salam to Sakina. Tell her I tried my best to bring you the water. But this is what happened. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين
After that, the family of Imam Hussein, after one after the other, the children of Aqil, the brothers of Muslim, came and sought the permission to go and fight before Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He said, your brother Muslim has already been sacrificed and killed. Why would you want to die as well? I give you the permission to leave me. They said, we shall never leave you until we join your grandfather Rasulullah in Jannah. So they all go and fight bravely until they are killed. And then all the brothers and, the, and, and all the cousins of Imam Hussein, one after the other, go into the battle until they are all killed. Then the only ones left with Imam Hussein are the children of Ummul Baneen Al-Abbas and his brothers alayhim salam then Al-Abbas comes to his brothers, his three brothers, and he says, Go before Imam Hussein and fight, and bring proud to us, to our mother, and to us before Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Let me witness your death before the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. All the three of them went and fought bravely, and they were all younger than Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas until they all got killed on the plains of Karbala. That's when Ibn Fadl al-Abbas came to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Qala ya Aba Abdullah Sayyidi laqad daqa sadri fa'adhan li fi al-khuruj li qitali ha'ula il-qawm. He said, Oh my beloved master, Ya Aba Abdullah, give me the permission to go and fight before you against those enemies of Allah. Imam al Hussein started crying, Qala akhi Aba al Fadl, anta hamilu liwa'i, kaafilu mahmali, in ghibta anni, sakat liwa'i. جمعي إلى الشتات قال أخي قال سيدي ولكن ضاق صدري He said oh my brother Abbas but you are the one carrying my banner you are the one taking care of the women of Bani Hashim and the children if I lose you then my banner will fall down on the plains of Karbala and my women and my children will be left without anyone to take care of them he said, but my brother, oh, but my master, oh, my master, but I want to fight against those enemies to defend you. He said, if indeed you have to go, then go and get some water for the children of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas then listened to the camp. Everyone is shouting, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. We are all thirsty, all the children are crying, thirsty, thirsty, we need some water. So his heart breaks for them. He takes the bag of water and says, I will bring the water to the family of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He heads towards the river of Fuad. It is said Umar ibn Sa'd had kept 4,000 men on that river to block the men of Imam Hussein alayhi salam from reaching the water. When they saw Abil Fadl al-Abbas and his bravery, they were afraid of him, they all departed and ran away. He made his way to the water, to the river. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, The heart of my uncle al-Abbas was boiling like a charcoal from the thirst. He dipped his hands into the water. The enemies were saying, we wanted to see what would he do. They said, they said we, he, we saw him dipping his hands to drink from the water. He raised the hands with the water, but then he threw the water. And we were surprised, why isn't he drinking? But then we heard him saying, قَالَ يَا نَفْسُ مِنْ بَعْدِ الْحُسَيْنِ هُونِي فَبَعْدَ مُولَا كُنْتِ أَنْ تَكُونِي هَذَا حُسَيْنٌ وَأَرِدَ الْمَنُونِ وَتَشْرَبِ بارد المعين والله ما دافع لديني ولا فعال صادق اليقين 
He said, oh my nafs, oh my soul, how can you drink the water when your master Hussein is still thirsty? This is not the teachings of your grand, of your father, Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is not the teachings of Allah. This is not how we have loyalty to the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So he throws the water and he fills up the bag of water and his main concern is to get it to the children and to get it to Sakina and Ruqayya and the baby of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He starts heading towards the camp of Imam Hussein. Umar ibn Sa'd yells at his people, stop him. For if the water reaches the camp of Imam Hussein and reaches Imam Hussein, we will never be able to defeat him after this. So one of the enemies of Allah hides behind a palm tree. As Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas comes by him, he strikes him on his left hand and he cuts it off. <laughs> then he says, Wallah, in qata'atumu yameeni, inni yuhami abadan an deeni, wa an imam sadiq al-yaqini, sibt al-nabiy al-mustafa al-ameen. He says, if you cut off my right hand, I will continue to fight and defend my master, Imam Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah. He takes the banner on his left hand and the water to his chest. And he continues, his main goal and aim is to get the water to the camp. Then another enemy of Allah strikes him on his left hand. تخشي من الكفار وأبشري برحمة الجبار اقطعوا ببغيم يساري فاصلهم يا رب حر النار He said oh my soul don't fear those enemies of Allah. Oh Allah, they have cut off my left hand, so burn them in the hellfire. He takes the banner of Imam Hussein into his chest along with the bag of water. Again, very determined, not feeling the pain. His main goal is to get the bag of water to Imam Hussein and the children of Bani Hashim. That's when an enemy of Allah strikes him with an arrow in his arm. But he continues to go until another arrow strikes the bag of water and all the water is shed. That's when he stood there, didn't know what to do. How can he go back to Sukaina and Ruqayya with an empty bag of water? As he was standing there, an enemy of Allah took a pillar, an iron pillar, and he struck, struck him on his head. رحم الله المنادي أيوة عباسا أيوة سيدا أيوة شهيدا He then fell on the plains of Karbala shouting أخي حسين أدرك أخاك Oh brother Hussein come and rescue your brother Imam Hussein at that moment rushed to Abin Fadl al-Abbas He managed to separate the enemies away from him He saw him a body without a right hand without a left hand with an arrow in the and he saw the banner is next to him on the plains of Karbala. He came to him and shouted, Akhiyab al Fadl, Al An al Kasara Bahri, Wakalat Hilati, Washamut Bi Adui. He said, Oh brother Abbas, now I feel as if my back is broken. I feel as if I am left all alone. Now it is the time that my enemies can mock me for your death, Ya Abel Fadl al Abbas. He then comes to him, he sits right next to him until his soul departs his body. He shouts, Aywa Akha, Wa Abbasa, Al-Aan, 
ولا تبغي الى الشتات He said oh my brother Abbas It is now that I know my women And my children have fallen as prisoners for Bani Umayyah Ah, he said oh my brother Abbas It is now that I know my women كل يا ابو فاضل على الاكبر تركت ومن حرى يجري عزيز وراح من ايدي وعليه تمالك صبري لكن فقدك يا ابو الغيره شعم البحواني ما تدري هدم بنيانا مالي وحق جدي وكسر ظهري ذن امام حسين عليه السلام went back to the tent زينب عليه السلام said يا ابا عبد الله where is my brother Abbas. He said, Ya Zainab, I left him next to the river of Furad. He has no right hand, no left hand, and there is an arrow in the eye. Then she started crying, Aywa Akha, Wa Abbasa, Wa Dayatahu Ba'dak. فصاح الحسين اي والله وضيعته بعدك يا ابا الفضل يقول هاي زين راح عباس راح عباس راح الضيق من يرفع الراس he said oh Zainab Abbas is gone she said now we are lost and indeed Imam Hussain says yes after Abul Madhul Abbas the camp is left now without a guardian to guard it Assalamu alayka يا وارث آدم صفوة الله السلام عليك يا وارث نوح النبي الله السلام عليك يا وارث إبراهيم خليل السلام عليك يا وارث موسى كليم الله السلام عليك يا وارث عيسى روح الله السلام عليك محمد حبيب الله السلام عليك يا وارث أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام ولي الله السلام عليك يا ابن محمد المصطفى السلام عليك يا ابن علي المرتضى السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا ابن خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور أشهد أنك قد أقمت الصلاة وآتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وأطعت الله ورسوله حتى أتاك اليقين 
فلعن الله أمة قتلت ولعن الله أمة ظلمت ولعن الله أمة سمعت بذلك فرضيت به يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد أنك كنت نورا في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة لم تنجسك الجاهلية بأنجاسها ولم تلبسك من مدلهمات ثيابها وأشهد أنك من دعائم الدين وأركان المؤمنين وأشهد أنك الإمام البر التقي الرضي الزكي الهادي المهدي وأشهد أن الأئمة من ولدك كلمة التقوى وأعلام الهدى والعروة الوثقى والحجة على أهل الدنيا وأشهد الله وملائكته وأنبياءه ورسله أني بكم مؤمن وبإيابكم موقن بشرائع ديني وخواتيم عملي وقلبي لقلبكم سيل وأمري لأمركم متبع صلوات الله عليكم وعلى أرواحكم وعلى أجسادكم وعلى أجسامكم وعلى شاهدكم وعلى غائبكم وعلى ظاهركم وعلى باطنكم
خجالت نکش وقتی خجالت میکشی شرمنده تر میشم سقا بدون دست هم سقاست باور کن تو چشم عباسم نبینم عشق غم باشه بی تو حسین تنهاست باور کن دریا تو دستات براده دریا تو دستات براده ممنون دستاتم علم دار دریا تو دستات دریا تو دستات براده ممنون دستاتم چشمات پر از خون شد عزیزم دلتنگ چشمات دریا تو دستات برادر ممنون دستات <تصفيق> ممنون دستات چشمات بر از خون شد عزیزم دلتنگ چشماتم علم دستم رو به پهلو میگیرم را که میرم اون چه نباید آقبت دیدی سرم اومد ای داد ای داد ای داد یا باب الهوائج دست خالی ردمون نمی کنی دستم رو به پهلو می گیرم را که می رم. اون چه نباید آقوت دیدی سرم اومد عباس جان تا که نشستم پیش تو انگار حس کردم یک لحظه بوی مادرم اومد دیدی بهت گفتم که بود صورت مادر مادر رو دیدی مادر اومد الغمه الغمه بوی گل یاس میاد صدای مادر عباس میاد مادرم رو دیدی دیدی بهت گفتم که بود صورت مادر دیدی بهت گفتم که خیلی سخت را میره دیدی چقدر سخت ببینی مادرت هر بار دستش رو به پهلوش میگیره یا زهرا دیدی بهت گفتم که بود صورت مادر دیدی بهت گفتم که خیلی سخت را میره دیدی چقدر سخت ببینی مادرت هر بار 
دستش رو به پهلوش میگی ای مادر 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 دستم رو به پهلو میگیرم را که میرم اون چه نباید آقبت دیدی سرم اومد تا که نشستم پیش تو انگار حس کردم یک لحظه بوی مادرم اون بالای سرش نشسته بعضی ها میگن عباس جون داده بود بعضی ها میگن نه هنوز رمقی داشت آقا هی نگاه کرد سعی کردیم بدن رو جا به جا کنه خودش هم متحیر بود عباس گفت یا اخی ما تو رید منی وقت منو به خیمه ها نبری آقا تنها برگشت حالا داره باش حرف میزنه دیگه عباس به شهادت رسیده عباس یادته تو که مدینه نبودی دیدی بهت گفتم که بود صورت مادر دیدی به دیدی گفتم دیدی خودت دیدی دیگه ای کاش تو مدینه بودی دیدی بهت گفتم که خیلی سخت را میره دیدی چقدر سخته به دیلی مادرت هر بار دستش رو به پنوش دریا تو دستات برادر ممنون دستاتم علم دا دریا تو دستات براده ممنون دستات چشمات بر از خون شد عزیزم دلتنگ چشمات دریا تو دستات براده ممنون دستات ملم دریا تو دستات براده ملم چشمات پر از خون شد عزیزم دلتنگ چشمات شرمنده نباش من شرمنده تر علم دارم برادرت شرمنده شد حسین با دیدن تو مرد و زنده شد خونه چشات و پس زدم با گریه ها هنوز از سیر اون نگاه با هم حرفی بزن این دم آخری یه حرف زد 
دید امام حسین میخواد بدن رو جمع کنه دست ها رو بیاره پاها رو بیاره نمیگم چرا نمیخوام بگم با پاها شکردن یه جمله گفت یا اخی ما تو رید منی میخوای با من چه کنی من رو سمت خیمه ها نبری حرفی بزن این دم آخری بگو چی شد دستای هیدری خوب میدونم الال عبد نیاد شبیه تو همه بگن زن و مرد صدا بزنن اول باس به آرزوش رسید خوب میدونی بالا سرش مادر و یه پیغام داشت داداش حسین عباس به آرزوش رسید خوب میدونی بالا سرش مادر و دید گفت بگو به حسین من با عشق و منتظرم باشه تو خاک قتلگاه حسین جان ازت من حالا میخوام سوال کنم راستی چرا قامت خمید بود رو صورتش جای کشید بود راستی چرا قامت خمید بود رو صورتش جای کشید بود خوب فهمیدم چرا داداش حسن جون به لبش رسیده بود یا اخا ادرک اخا کیا حسین یا مادرت اومده بیا مادرت اومده بیا یا اخا
بعد تو لبای خشک دخترم به چه روزی افتاده به چه روزی افتاده ای امید دخترم برگرد ای امید دخترم برگرد پناه اهل حرم برگرد امیر صاحب علم برگرد باشو برگردی داشتم یه جوری گریه
اما به خواهش محزم به شوق دیدن تو حرام باد به چشمان ابری من خواب مباد خوفت به ما تو بیا که ناشدنی شد به تو رسیدن من چه ساده می شود اما به من رسیدن تو به من رسیدن تو بیا که ناشدنی شد به تو رسیدن من چه ساده می شود اما به من رسیدن تو به من رسیدن تو به من رسیدن تو أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله مع محمد والي الأطهار يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اللهم اقض حوائجهم شافي مرضاهم احفظهم في أوطانهم وديارهم بحفظك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يده اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج 
ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح أموات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات